a hexwoman, a demoness, a possessor of the evil eye. Rose Veris was a woman of many names in her Detroit neighborhood, but she was perhaps best known for her community moniker, the Witch of Del Rey. She was said to lock her piercing, cold, blue-gray eyes in unwavering stares at those she encountered. Some said her look had the power to hypnotize. Others said she used her power to control the neighborhood and the tenants of her boarding house, her sullen figure lording over them in her shapeless black widower gown, a knit hairpiece atop her graying head. According to legend, she killed 12 men in her Medina Street boarding home, serving over a decade in prison for just one of them. But legend isn't always what it seems. This is Michigan Crime Stories. Michigan Crime Stories is a podcast that explores murder, mysteries, and mayhem in the Mitten State. Criminal behavior has always enthralled us. It's when societies determine what is and isn't allowed. We assume heinous crimes are committed by monsters, individuals we dehumanize in an effort to make sense of their deeds. Their victims sometimes seem distant, just faded names in a passing headline. But the terrifying truth is that crimes are committed by ordinary people just like you and me. And many of those crimes happen right in our own backyard. My name is Darcy Moran. And this is John Counts. We're reporters for MLive.com and your hosts for Michigan Crime Stories. This episode is titled, The Witch of Del Rey. In 1931, the city of Detroit was a city on edge. In just a few short decades, it had swelled to become the nation's fourth largest city. New additions speckled the skyline from the Ambassador Bridge to the newly erected Art Deco Marvels, like the Fisher and the Guardian buildings. They told a story of wealth and prosperity, but the streets below sang a different tune. The Great Depression had Detroit by its throat, and gangs had wormed their way up to profit off of prohibition. Their work made Detroit a leader in the nation for alcohol imports, but their wars left bodies in the streets and politicians and police seemingly didn't care to fight the crime. A mayor of the previous year, Charles Bowles, was quoted as saying, it is just as well to let these gangsters kill each other off if they are so minded. Bowles was Ku Klux Klan supported at a time when the Great Migration was still underway. African Americans and immigrants alike flooded the city for auto worker jobs, only to have production drop drastically. Hungarians like Rose Veris found a home in the Del Rey neighborhood at the confluence of the Detroit and Rouge Rivers. She'd attempted to follow her husband to the United States, only to find he'd left her. So, she settled in her own boarding house for laborers, and there her title of witch sprang up. So too did her body count. The exact number of men who died in Veris' home differ in news accounts of the time, but it said at least five men died of acute alcoholism, two hanged themselves, and a new husband and his friend died of carbon monoxide poisoning. A garage door had slammed shut while they worked on a car on a cold winter's day. A police probe led to a brief arrest for Rose Varys once before, but she was released. As Karen Dibus, author of The Witch of Del Rey, Rose Varys, and Detroit's infamous 1930s murder mystery tells us, Rose Varys wouldn't get off so easily when Steve Mack plunged to his death. Police are called to the scene on a hot August day that one of the boarders living in Rose's house has mysteriously either fallen or been pushed. And they're hearing from multiple neighbors, different versions. Either they saw him go in a window on a second story of her duplex and come flying out, or they saw his body in the window and then projectiled out. So someone either shoved him or gave him enough of a springboard to get him out the window, crashes into the neighboring house, and then down onto the ground where his injuries are so serious he's sent to the hospital and then dies two days later. And so the police are like, okay, we got the body. We've got neighbors who are suspicious and say they saw a set of arms push from the window or a face in that frame where the body had been. We got enough of a a, a curious circumstance 
that we're going to take this forward and we're going to bring all our evidence to the prosecutor and see where it goes. Though news reports vary widely, Divis believes Rose Varys was in her 50s and Mac was in his 40s at the time of the incident. Varys and her 18-year-old son, William, were arrested and news reporters descended, excitement quickly growing as they learned the immigrant's neighborhood name. The Witch of Del Rey splashed across headlines throughout the nation, and news reports recounted the witch's cold stare, a supposed confession, and her penchant for taking out insurance policies on her borders. Meanwhile, prosecutors developed their theory, buoyed by their key witness, an African-American man named John Walker, who shared the duplex with Rose Varys. It was said Rose Varys and her son took out a life insurance policy on Mac, some $4,000, and tried to kill him. When poison didn't work, William and another man beat Mac in the basement of the Medina Street home, prosecutors said. The group then took him up through the attic and tossed him out the window. The Varys family defense attorney argued Mac's death was an accident, the result of a slip while climbing a ladder to repair a broken window. But it didn't matter. Rose and William Varys were sentenced to life in prison. But the witch's story didn't end with the clink of a cell door. Her gaze, though behind bars, was said to have led to a former boarder's slashed throat. And then, through an odd turn of events, her cell door opened. The prosecutor, who'd put the Varys' mother and son duo behind bars, found himself behind bars. A scorned lover's suicide note had outed officials that had been taking bribes, Duncan McRae among them. It's unclear why, but after his conviction, McRae sought out fellow Jackson prison inmate William Varys and encouraged Varys to protest his innocence. The glass ceiling shattering legal force Aileen Klutz took the case. Klutz tore down the prosecutor's case first for William and then for Rose. She's able to discover not only this idea that the theory that Rose perhaps has actually like physically lifted Steve Mack into the attic, which was put forward by the prosecutor in the 1931 trial, that that was not only physically impossible, but structurally the house could not have sustained that kind of like bulking, you know, dead weight being thrown around. The, the, the attic was unfinished. The access panel to the attic was so small that, you know, shoving a uh, large man like Steve Mack up through that hole would have been physically impossible. So she's able to find like structural engineers that can testify to that. She's able to find doctors who are able to testify to the fact that, you know, there wouldn't be any way for a, a woman of Rose's size to be able to do what she's claimed to have done. And she was able to find neighbors who could refute things that were previously testified to in the first trial. But the most significant thing she can do and she does through just sheer force of will is gain Rose's trust. Enough that Rose is willing to not only tell her what happened that day in August of 1931, but be confident enough then to testify on her behalf. Uh, her own story is then told to a jury. So Rose is willing to sit in that witness box and explain what happened that day and that she was not responsible for Steve Mack's death. And in this retrial for Rose in 1945, the jury hearing her words and seeing her conviction that no, she had nothing to do with it, weighs a certain percentage more heavily into their decision making. And it gives them more reason to believe that what is said she did, she could not have done, both from the physical point of view, the structural makeup of that house and where she might have been that day, and through everything that the other people testify that Rose wasn't even on site when this, this fall happens, that she was actually at a neighboring store. So she wouldn't have been able to, to do the crime. And it puts all that testimony, even the witnesses they can find in 1945, who come back to testify against her into question. And that's all that it takes. A little bit of reasonable doubt and the wonderful attorney skills of Aileen Klutz against a prosecutor that is a little bit more lackluster in 1945 than was in 1931. And the jury finds Rose innocent and she is released from prison. Rose Varys is said to have fainted when the verdict was delivered. She'd thought the jury had read guilty one more time. After spending 14 years in prison, Rose Varys, now in her 60s, moved to the Detroit suburb of Melvindale to live out her days. Divis has since debunked much of the remaining mystery surrounding the Witch of Del Rey's legend. 
According to Dibus, when put in perspective, the mix of the Great Depression, Prohibition, and men a sea away from their families in a heavily used boarding home made the number of deaths at the Medina Street home seem far more reasonable. And Roseberry's purported penchant for buying life insurance policies could be attributed to the cultural practice of lavish funerals. Steve Mack, Dibus said, was the only one not to receive such a funeral. Dibus hopes to change that with a marker for his grave. Still, perhaps the biggest and most difficult claim to debunk is Roseberry's skill in the dark arts. Anything that went wrong for this part of Del Rey could be blamed on Rose or the witch. So if your husband left you for another woman, or even Rose, it's her fault. She hexed him. If your chickens didn't make it, if your garden didn't grow, I mean, there was some bizarre accusations, but they could always be tied back to it's Rose's fault. And she, even though she probably was a very well-known personality in the neighborhood, really cannot find any evidence or descriptions of her ever practicing like what we would consider witchcraft that she didn't grow medicinal herbs or do any kind of like midwifery there's no connection to any kind of mysticism to her um, i can't even find any case where she's like a member of a church even though as a hungarian she probably attended one of the local catholic churches so there's there's very hard to say that her reputation for hex or witchcraft is even warranted but yet i think because of so much going on in the city of detroit and so much negativity in people's day-to-day -day lives anyone that had what seemed like a, a bit of good fortune and in rose's case when she did lay to rest a few of her boarders it sounds like the funerals that she held were showy enough and were um, well paid for so that she might have had a photographer she might have had like a wreath on the door and those things were expensive at the time and even though in the Hungarian tradition a big funeral is a typical thing maybe the new neighbors who are coming into Del Rey like the walkers who are African-American and some of the others who weren't familiar with that culture it would seem weird it would seem different it would seem like she had some sort of uh, larger than life, maybe a uh, connection to darker things. And, and the witch thing just continued to haunt her as not a positive, but definitely as this negative. And she was, she was a bad force to be reckoned with. The legend of the Witch of Del Rey persists to scare young children and serve as an interesting factoid in the city of Detroit. A bar even borrowed the moniker for a drink name, according to Dibus. But Diva said she hopes to finally let Rose rest. Now, with the truth. So the idea that she had killed 10 men with carbolic acid was printed in a, in a magazine in 2018. And when I read it, it was so jaw-dropping to me that I spent the rest of those days uh, trying to make sure that the magazine understood that there was a real truth out there, that a second trial had happened, that even though you can have your suspicions as the dear reader or as an individual investigator, the fact of the matter is a court of law found her innocent. A jury deemed that she did not commit that crime. And if you don't honor and respect that, then there is no justice in this country. And there is a true cruelty in sustaining the idea that she committed murder when her peers said she did not. And so to give her that benefit of living in peace and having a legacy of maybe being a great grandmother is far more truthful than to purport the Witch of Del Rey and to use that kind of cruel nickname against her to this point. So people are a lot more than just that kind of sustained story. Uh, she was a human being and so was her son and her heirs and her legacy deserves better. Hey, this is John Counts with Michigan Crime Stories. I'm sitting here with uh, Darcy Moran, who reported the story, and I've got a few questions for her. So she spent 14 years in prison, is that right? Yeah, 14 years. Though. And do we know anything about her time in prison? Where did, where did she serve her time? So I believe she um, was at a, a Detroit area prison. Uh, um, but what Karen Divis has been able to gather and tell me is that um, during that time, Roseberry's uh, health declined um, somewhat. 
uh, dramatically. Um, so she was a very different woman um, when she came to her retrial in uh, 1944-45. Gotcha. So it seems like uh, the witchiness was kind of code for some sort of like sexist language back then. So looking at this through a lens of sort of modern feminism, I mean, what what is this about, like, this witchiness and, like, you know, talk a little bit about that. Well, I think that's a really interesting idea. You know, it's hard to say if, if it was um, completely, you know, based in this, this uh, feminist issue back then, but I don't think that's something that you can ignore, right? Um, witches aren't, aren't, you didn't come across a lot of accusations of warlocks. Um, so was it the fact that um, Rose Varys was this huge presence and was able to have a great standing in the community and have money and uh, have this presence, um, you know, whereas a man did not or, you know, she didn't have a man in her life the whole time? Was that part of the mystique? Quite possibly. So you said she ended up living, in, living out her days in Melvindale. Any idea about what happened to her after that? So it's uh, interesting as well, um, you know, the, this woman that's known for her hex and being able to put curses is said to have enjoyed uh, bingo in her remaining days and uh, spending time with her grandchildren. So a very different existence than what we're told to believe about her uh, previous years in the neighborhood of Del Rey. All right, Darcy, interesting stuff. Thanks for uh, researching that story for us. Thank you so much. And this has been Michigan Crime Stories. I'm John Counts. And I'm Darcy Moran. Thanks to Karen Dibus for speaking to us. You can pick up a copy of The Witch of Del Rey, Rose Berries, and Detroit's infamous 1930s murder mystery through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or Arcadia Publishing. Also, thanks to you for listening. Michigan Crime Stories is about telling the hidden, unknown, important, or odd stories in the state of Michigan. If you know a story that might fit the bill or something you'd like to know more about, you can email me at dmoran at mlive.com. That's dmoran at mlive.com. I'm Darcy Moran, and this is Michigan Crime Stories.